uh, that we receive from HUD. So um, HUD and ICDA requirements are the requirements set thresholds for the application and then through the thresholds we identify projects that need ongoing support uh, through a performance improvement plan based on the ranking or anything of that nature but it it shows us a snapshot of the, the projects and what we're working with as far as data goes so with coc funding and data points apr data for all coc funded projects are reported to hud so um apr reports all of the projects to HUD, a large section of the NOFO uh, once that we apply to as a collaborative applicant, once again, they revolve around this data that is that is submitted on the behalf of the projects into HMIS. If the application is not strong enough in the data uh, around the data element questions, so a large chunk of the NOFO is around data quality uh, just APR data in general. It's a fairly uh, large section that results in the final scoring. If those points aren't strong enough, then we will not be able to score a high enough uh, scoring within that section of the, the NOFO. So that can also result in a loss of funding, um, not only for this competition or for the NOFO that we're applying to, but it does not necessarily mean that that funding will come back around to the state of Indiana. So once it's gone, it does get circled out across uh, the states. So every year, um, each NOFO is different. So there's different questions that are based around APR data and uh, system performance measures. But in general, the data quality plays an important role when funding is evaluated. So uh, let's get specific in system performance measures. So HUD has developed seven system performance measures to help COCs gauge their uh, performance in preventing and ending homelessness. So here are the list of the seven. So that includes the length of time a person uh, has remained homeless, the extent to uh, persons who exit to homelessness and permanent housing, number of uh, homeless persons, jobs and income growth, uh, for homeless persons and these funded programs, a uh, number of persons who become homeless for the first time and homelessness prevention and housing placements of persons who are defined by category three and successful housing placement. So the purpose of these seven measures is to provide an accurate picture of how well the COC is um, preventing and ending homelessness. So these system performance measures are used throughout the NOFO as a, a data collection that HUD uh, views to award projects under future NOFOs. So we as RCDA, we pull this data from HMIS, which uh, is trickled down from the project management side uh, for you guys. And when we compile this, all this information, HUD requires an annual reporting requirement uh, for us to submit the data that hopefully aligns with the SPMs that they are referring to uh, in the previous slide. So the evaluation is completed by HUD to determine how well the COCs are improving. Once again, um, these system performance measures might change from year to year. Uh, for example, COVID-19 uh, pandemic was a big one that changed a lot of uh, system performance measures. Things that you were required to report uh, were waived and so forth. So things did look a little different from um, comparing to certain circumstances that are happening throughout the year. But essentially, all of these should be the same and aligned with the uh, performance measures that HUD provides. Okay, so this is moving on to the APR. So according to our data quality plan that can be found on our website, we suggest that um, APRs are ran quarterly uh, to keep up with errors to make sure things have times to be adjusted. But um, and to test your APR, you can go to the SAGE website without having to use a login to run a report as frequently as you need to to keep up with your data quality. But um, ICDA requests 
our, your APR annually, and that is usually at the end of your grant year to evaluate your spending and performance. So this is our uh, a short uh, snippet of our, our, our process. So after your grant expires, um, 60 days after your grant expires, your APR and your grant closeout form and your match uh, form and supporting documentation is due to your grant analyst. Uh, the APR will be reviewed by us and we will submit a closeout report on the behalf of the organization um, that is or the project that we'll be submitting. In the review process on our end, we're looking for four big points on the APR before we even submit. So of course a match is a big um, portion of that and that will be a future session as well. But we're focusing on the APR, we're looking at to make sure that none of the error rates exceed 15%. The bed and utilization data is accurate in terms of uh, comparing what was presented in the original application and what is being performed quarterly. Uh, living situation and exit destination is are the four points that we are looking at to make sure that your APR passes the approval. So the error rate. So um, here is a snapshot of an APR. So you should be able to filter through your APR once it is uh, uploaded from and this is from the sage point of view so when you actually do the zip file there will just be a bunch of files so when you actually test it and actually look at the data you can see actually these uh, data points and questions that i am seeing here on the screen so we want to make sure that the percentage of error rate stays underneath 15 percent for any of these uh, locations so um, a lot of it is around uh, PII, making sure that the inf there's no error rate there, uh, universal data elements, and income and housing data quality, income and uh, sources at annual assessment, exit, and so forth. So if these errors, if this section is showing higher than 15%, we do require that, I and mean, we encourage that errors are fixed prior to submitting, but we will have to ask you to go in and, and fix your data quality before we can move forward with submitting this information to HUD. Because uh, once again, these same data points that we're looking at, HUD is requiring and they don't want to see anything that is above 15%. Another point, uh, the next point would be bed and unit utilization. So, Question 7B and question 8B are used to reflect the number of beds and units that are occupied throughout the year. So um, this 18, 20, and uh, 18, and 18, again, these are the quarterly amounts that are for this quarter for the year. So these numbers are reflected quarterly for the project term in comparison to actually what's presented on the award. So that is how you would read these sections. Most of the time, these numbers will differ from what's proposed in the original application. And as you can see here, so this project proposed that they have 20 units in 20 beds in their original application. Well, quarterly through their time, uh, throughout the length of the grant, they had only 18 units, 18 beds, 19, 19, 19 for the rest of the year. So it shows an average of um, proposed um, compared to actually uh, served. So obviously this number is different from the original uh, proposed number 20 in the application. This will have to be explained on the grant closeout form. So uh, most of the time, a HUD wants to see why there's a difference in what was proposed in the application initially when um, the project started unto throughout the year. This can be any reason. Uh, there were a number of vacancies due to X, Y, and Z. Just a short reason, uh, but something has to be placed on the grant closeout form to list uh, that change and that uh, reflect that information. Okay, living situation is a big one. So for um, PSH and RRH projects specifically, um, 
they should not have households coming from other locations, which is section um, question 15 of the APR report. So to receive um, assistance, the household must meet the definition by the terms of homeless situations and in, in, uh, institutional settings. So other locations is not listed in for any qualified PSH client. So if there's a household that is coming from another location and this section specifically should all be zero, um, that does have to be explained in the living situation uh, on the closeout form. So sometimes we do have clients that might be in these um, other location sections, but it's very seldom and most of the time that does not qualify um, a client to be receiving PSH if they're coming from a different living situation. But either way, it does have to be explained on the grant closeout form. And most and most of the time, it, if it is an error, uh, usually the program is pretty good about uh, finding that error or finding that client and correcting it. Um, but once again, if it's not explained, we will request an explanation on the back end. So for DB specific programs, so when someone is fleeing, they may be coming from another location that is not specified in the report, but the pro it's up to the program once again to be specific as possible to fit their situation and explain this on the grant closeout form. So as you see here below, um, this program has one client staying or living in a family member's room, apartment or house. They are coming from that location into the program. Unlike PSH, um, PSH should have people coming through coordinated entry or a different avenue, but for domestic violence uh, victims or someone that is fleeing from domestic violence, it won't fit the same um, concept but it still has to be explained. This one client will have to be explained, you know, their situation of why they're coming from another location. So um, in specific DV projects should make sure that their clients are entered correct correctly on uh, question 14B um, and have the specific number of clients that are fleeing to match up with um, the locations that the people are coming from in a APR. So if the clients are not marked correctly in this question of 14B, this could impact the data quality reported in the internal competition. And it can we can have we do see a hard time with the, the numbers on the back end, making sure everything lines up uh, on the end of that. OK, so exit destination is the last point that we see um, here on the APR that sometimes has some errors. So this would be question 23 of the APR. Program should not be releasing individuals back to homelessness. So this category is for clients who do not fit in the permanent destinations or temporary destinations or institutional settings section of the APR. If there is a household that is located in other destinations, it once again should be explained on the grant closeout form and demonstrating that efforts are being made to ensure clients are exiting the program correctly should be explained. So other destinations uh, in this case are listed here. Uh, you do not have to explain deceased, of course, but that one person and other has to be explained. Um, if this is an error by any means, then it, it should be corrected and resubmitted on the behalf of the program. But there should not be any clients being exited to other destinations, um, only to permanent destinations, temporary or institutional settings, if applicable. So some takeaway points from this um, presentation, we want to make sure that you know as a program that your APR data reflects your organization. So we're working together to 
be able to pre uh, present an accurate reflection of all the hard work that you do to serve your community and to make sure that we are showing the collective performance to HUD when they are requesting the system performance measures, the APR, or any other data in terms of scoring. Um, and then data is pushed to HUD for review, but if the data quality is poor, then that does result in direct poor outcomes. So improvement with data quality can increase funding opportunities as far as um, the COC project goes. So, and then um, <clears throat> if there's a, a common error that we see that usually the common errors will need to be corrected uh, before resubmitting an, an APR to to us, but if we're seeing a lot of clients in these specific locations that aren't, they're not supposed to be, we we don't assume it's an error. We will ask if it's an error first, and then usually it can be corrected in an X amount of time. But those, if you're seeing a lot of clients in other locations of any of those sections that are previously mentioned, we want you to know that usually those clients are not in compliance with the COC regulations. So most of the time it is an error and we expect for it to be identified and corrected from a program level before we can even submit to HUD. Okay. Any questions about any of that that we went over? And I am going to come back to come from sharing so I can see everybody's faces because it's pretty hard. <laughs> Any questions on that? Um, I put my question. Oh, oh in the chat. I see it got answered. OK. Actually, let me read what this says. OK. And then we will be, um, I will gladly attach this uh, presentation to uh, by email so you guys can have this as a source um, and a direct resource when it's time to submit anything or closeouts or just as reference. And then uh, Misty, I think that was a head shake as you understood what Jenna yeah, was. Yeah, I did. Yeah, okay. thank you. OK, I'm just making sure. Any other questions on the correlation or just anything on that? OK. All right, so um, we want to phase in to the next part of the presentation here. And I'm going to share my screen once again. Oops, sorry. Um, so we want to talk about the um, HUD expedited waiver notice. And I think uh, Jenna, if you want to take over on that. Okay, um, Candace, there is a question in the chat. Oh, um, okay. go ahead. <laughs> I don't know if you want to cover that while I start or. Yes. Okay. Did um, you? Sorry, did you want to share your screen or you're okay with? Yeah, what you have is fine. Okay. I'll have to get into the chat here. I think you might need to mute so there's not feedback. Yes. Okay, I think we should be good to go now. Um, so I'm gonna go over the COC waivers that HUD um, sent out back in probably mid-June. Um, yeah, I can't. I gotta see the screen. Uh, the, uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, I will go ahead and share my screen and just show what the uh, waivers look like, what that document looks like. Um, so we sent out an announcement. I think it was last week. Um, you should have received something that looks like this that kind of goes over what the different waivers are. Um, you should also have a form that looks like this. This is what you'll need to fill out to request the waivers. 
um, you need to make sure that you are including your HUD grant number down here. So that would be the IN um, grant number that you have. Um, and then the specific waivers that HUD is offering, um, you have to have your request in to us at IHCDA by July 21st. Um, we'll then compile all of those and send those to HUD. Um, for right now, we're saying the start date that you can begin using those waivers is August 1st. We did reach out to HUD for further clarification, but from the language in the document, it sounds like those should start on August 1st. And then the majority of them will be in effect until March 31st of 2023, unless otherwise specified in the document. Um, if you are going to be using those waivers, once we have the waiver request form in from you, you will need to have specific documentation for each client that you plan to use that waiver for. Um, so that documentation would need to include um, notice that you're using a waiver for that specific client as well as why the waiver is needed. So for example, you would just need to have a statement in the client file or somewhere in HMIS that specifies, um, for instance, if you are going to use um, waiver number three saying something like there is a lack of affordable housing in our service area in order to prevent this client from remaining unhoused. We need to be able to go above FMR up to rent reasonableness to secure a unit for this client. So you would just need a statement like that in the client's file showing why the waiver is necessary for that client. Um, there are six waivers that were released by HUD. Um, the first one, housing quality standards. Um, this has to deal with the inspection of units. This waives the requirement that inspections have to be done in person. Um, so with this, inspections may be done by a proxy. So that could be a landlord, the property representative, a tenant, or any adult associated with the eventual tenancy of the unit. Um, they can complete a virtual inspection um, and provide that to the subrecipient or do it over like FaceTime or Skype, something like that. Um, the project is still responsible for ensuring that the unit meets housing quality standards. So you would still have to ultimately make sure that any judgment decisions are correct. Um, and you would also need to make sure that the proxy that you have completing the inspections has the accurate or the necessary equipment to do those inspections. Um, and then if there are any situations where technology limits your ability to make a determination, then you need to have policies and procedures in place on how to handle that. Um, and this waiver that is released by HUD does not supersede any federal, state, or local law that you would have to follow anyways. So if there is something in place that you have to consider when you're doing the housing quality standards, um, this would not waive that requirement. You would still have to abide by that. Um, the second waiver that was released by HUD is for suitable dwelling size and housing quality standards, and this would be specifically for rapid rehousing projects. Um, so with this waiver, um, projects may assist program participants to move into housing with more than two persons per room, which is typically unallowed by housing quality standards, so you're able to house more people per room. Um, this should be balanced with the public health recommendations to limit the spread of COVID-19. Um, and this waiver would only be available for leases or occup occupancy agreements that are signed between August 1st and through March 31st. Um, this waiver specifically would expire at the client level at the end of the initial term of the lease or occupancy agreement or on March 31st, whichever is later. So there is a possibility that this could extend past March 31st if the client's lease extends past March 31st of 2023. Um, for the third waiver, this has to deal with fair market rent for individual units and leasing costs. So this would specifically apply to projects that have leasing funds. Typically you are limited, so you can't go above FMR with this. That would waive that requirement. So you are able to go above FMR in your area as long as it is, as long as the rent that you are paying would be considered rent reasonable. Um, this is only available for leases of individual units that are signed between the release of the notice. So that would be probably August 1st um, up through March 31st. Um, for this waiver, um, you can request that it extends through the end of the client's lease or through the end of the 
budget period for your award, whichever is sooner. So if this if the client's lease were to go past March 31st, you could request that the waiver stay in place through the end of that client's lease. Or if your um, say your operating year is March or April 1st through. Uh, or sorry, if it would if your operating year would be May 1st through April 31st, then you could request that the waiver remain in place until April 31st, which would be the expiration of that operating year and then your new one would start. Um, it would have to end at the end of your current operating year, if that makes sense. Um, the fourth waiver that was released has to deal with the one year lease requirement that is in place. Um, so this would be for rapid rehousing. Um, this allows you to execute a lease that is for less than one year, so long as the initial term of the lease is, initial term of the lease is at least for one month. So that should give you a little bit more flexibility when you're looking for landlords. Um, waiver number five has to deal with permanent housing um, and rapid rehousing. The limit of 24 months of rental assistance. This would allow you to go beyond the 24 month cap. Um, since there are um, COC um, state level policies that limit you to 12 months, um, there is a way to go past that if you have approval um, or if the client needs extended assistance to prevent them from returning to homelessness. So if you do have that approval to go up to the 24 month cap, um, then this waiver would allow you to go past that and then the extended assistance would need to end by March 31st of 2023. Um, this would be only for clients that would need the extended assistance um, to prevent them from becoming homeless because they would not be able to afford their rent without the additional assistance. Um, and then the final waiver that was released has to deal with disability documentation for permanent, permanent supportive housing projects. Um, typically, um, you need evidence of disability um, reported within 45 days, which is, or you need acceptable evidence of disability um, reported by intake staff accompanied by another type of suitable documentation. So that would be written verification of disability from a professional, uh, written verification from Social Security Administration, receipt of a disability check, um, or other documentation approved by HUD. That is what is typically required with this waiver. You would be able to go beyond that 45 day requirement um, or the client that you're serving would also be able to self certify. And for this waiver, um, that would be in effect until March 31st. So at that point, you would have to receive um, another form of suitable documentation that shows their disability. Otherwise, the client would no longer have eligibility. Does anybody have any questions about any of the waivers or how to apply to that? Um, if you didn't receive the form or the notification of that, go ahead and put your email in the chat and then I can send something out to you with those forms that you would need. Okay. And I want to specify on that as well that it is per grant number. So if your grant number is, um, it requires multiple clients to have a certain amount of waivers, or if you need multiple waivers for just different clients across the board, you just, it, it can be applied. It's just, you have to make sure that you have the specified grant number for the clients that are underneath that hood grant number. If you do not have your HUD grant number by any means, it is on your agreement um, at the very top. But if you don't have that information handy, you could just contact us and we can get you the grant number that uh, is applicable to that waiver. Okay. And um, there's some questions coming in the chat. So um, we can send you a copy of the um, the waiver notice that uh, was created a few weeks ago along with the form, so we can send you both of those documents. Um, so uh, Shannon, we have a client who was in 
a house through rapid housing. However, she had an episode. She's talking about. Sorry, I'm just reading the chat here. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Shannon, I know you put it in the chat. Uh, do you have uh, just a, a little bit uh, more details on that, or is, is that all you have right now? Hello? Okay. Well, I guess I can answer based off um, what it is. So we'll get you a response here in the chat uh, shortly. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll get your response here shortly. Um, is there any other questions in uh, pertaining to the waivers? Just any of a uh, thing that we discussed. We had a lot of information here today, so I just want to make sure everybody has what they need. Okay, we have some more emails coming in. Okay, and uh, once again, the deadline uh, to get those uh, waivers submitted to us is July 21st and um, to our co uh, community services uh, inbox as well. And we can give you that email when we send out the notice. Okay, well, if there is not any other questions, uh, once again, Shannon, I will get to you. Um, oh. Once again, adding Shannon on our. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll get the questions answered in the chat um, once we get the the waiver information out. Uh, if there isn't anything else, we'll make sure that we have this recording available to you as a resource as well. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time, everyone. Bye.